Um, I think that one can probably call the Guide of the Perplexed the most influential work in the history of Jewish philosophy. Um, and you'll notice that it announces its intended audience in its title. Yeah, it's written for people who are perplexed. Yeah? If you don't have questions, you don't need answers. Right? Um, so, Jewish philosophy often arises out of perplexity, out of questions or problems. Um, so, you'll be glad to know that I'm perplexed. Okay? And I'm going to sh share my perplexity with you. Um, because I've been studying and, and writing about Orot HaTshuva, okay? Lights of Repentance, uh, Rav Avram Yitzchak HaKohen Cooks, writings on repentance. They were kind of, you know, pulled together, published in 1925 by his son, uh, Rav Svi Yehuda Cook, who pulled them from his spiritual diaries um, and edited them, edited them together into this work. Um, and the reason that I'm perplexed is the following. Okay, you, you probably all read classic works of, of um, well, not just Jewish thought, of kind of, you know, any type of, you know, Jewish religious text. And they'll often have a kind of a, a preface. And in the preface, you will have things like, Vani Afar Afar, I'm dust and ashes, who am I, blah, blah. Okay? Ruff Cook writes the following in his preface to Orot HaTshuva. Okay, have a look, it's the first quote you've got there. Um, look what he says. It says, okay, so you know, lots been written in Torah Navim, kind of by the Chachamim about Tshuva. Um, but you know, at this point, it's still kind of a sealed, kind of hidden matter that needs to be clarified. And what he goes on, Hasifrut. So our, our literature, yeah, which, I mean, literally there wanders into every corner where there is, um, you know, song and light, as in, you know, covers everything. Everything important is covered. What is that? Hasn't penetrated at all, okay, into the great treasure of, treasure of tshuva, it's not even, you know, really kind of, you know, begun to show a genuine interest in it, okay? What's he talking about? All right, what does that mean? All right, so instead of I am dust and ashes, it's nobody's done this, nobody's actually written anything significant about Truva, so here we go, all right? It's a very strange thing to write, especially when you think about our literature, okay? You've got plenty on Truva. All right, apart from, you know, just kind of, you know, dotted around the Gemara, you've got, you know, various, you know, Mamre Chazal, but you've got Sharei Tshuva by Rabbeinu Yona back in the kind of, you know, 12th, 13th century. You've got Hilchot Tshuva, which is admittedly part of a, you know, larger work by the Rambam, but you've certainly got significant works written about Tshuva. So what is Rav Cook on about? Okay, that's my problem, that's my perplexity. And I want to share with you um, an answer, okay, a couple of possible answers. Um, obviously, you can read the book and you'll see what's original and what's, what's kind of new about it, but I think that there are kind of two strands in particular, one can but speculate on exactly the cause of his, um, his dismay at the state of the literature on Tshuva. But I think there are two things in particular that he is uh, um, dealing with and that he's kind of disappointed. He thinks just hasn't really been done. And depending on how much kind of, you know, um, how quickly we get through this, um, we'll look at either one or both of them. All right? Um, so, the first one. All right? I think the first idea that Rav Cook really brings to the fore that he believes has not been sufficiently um, in the foreground of treatments of tshuva till this point, okay? I, possibly, you know, in, in certain mystical works, but certainly not in anything that's more popular, is the cosmic element to tshuva. We think of tshuva as something individual. We go, we do it because we sin and we do something about it. But of course, tshuva has all the way back to the Gemara, been seen as much more than that. 
If you have a look just at a couple of brief quotes that uh, you've got there, one from Yuma, which is famously, Amar Rab Yonatan Gedola Tshuva Shemakarevet Et Hagula. All right? But, you know, repentance actually hastens, brings near redemption, the ultimate redemption. Okay? It's not just about me saying sorry for my sins. It's got this cosmic effect. Right? Even more than that, Okay, from Pesachim, this is a, a brighter. Shivad varim nivru kodem shenivra haolam ve'elohein Torah utshuva. Okay, and the rest of them you can look at yourselves. All right, so more than that, tshuva is something that was that preceded creation. Okay, well, again, I'm not entirely sure what that means. All right, it's, it's kind of relatively easy, to the others. Yeah, God could have had a Torah before the world was created, I suppose. You could have had Gan Eden and, 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 and Kehinnom and Kisar covered. These are, you know, things that... But Tshuva is an act that we do. How can that be created before, before we're here? All right, so number one. I think Rav Cook believes that this kind of cosmic aspect of Tshuva has not been sufficiently treated to this point. And in looking at what he says about it, hopefully we can actually get to the bottom of uh, what it means to say, not only that Shiva brings this gula, but more than that, I'm going to have a go at explaining what it means to say that Shiva was created before the world was created. Okay? That's number one. So let's have a look at what Rav Cook says. Okay, first thing we need to know about Rav Cook. Rav Cook was what is known as a monist. Okay? A monist believes that all reality at its root is one single unity. Okay? We see things, do we see there are lots of different individuals, individual subjects, okay, like you know, there's philosophy, there's history, there's science, there's all kind of you know, disparate individual things, individual people, different religions, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Rav Cook believes that in its essence, that's not true. That all of reality is unified. And the reason it's all unified is because it's all God. Okay, God is the only true reality. Have a look. The uh, final quote on the first page is from Orota Kodesh. It's the only quote from Orota Kodesh. All the others from Rav Cook are from Orota Chuva. Um, but in Orota Kodesh, he says the following. So, kind of, you know, carrying on from what he's just said. Yeah, the true reality is divine, it's God. All right, and more than that, and this will become very important as we move on. And all reality that descends from the heights of kind of being godlike, if you like, is nothing but the descent of the will. Okay, in its kind of imperfect choices. All right, so it's something to do kind of, if you like, creation, our world that we see as something separate. We, there's God and God created something else, which is a world, and we see these things as separate. Somehow that's a reflection of some kind of degraded act of the will, okay, of these kind of imperfect choices. All right, and he goes on... Um, but at the end, all this tuma will kind of, you know, be done with, be finished. And the will, yeah, through its kind of freedom, will rise back to kind of absolute goodness. Yeah, and and God will be one again. Okay? So the idea is, reality is God. We don't see, I mean, you know, don't know about you, but, you know, it's a desk, all right? It's not God, all right? What does it mean to say reality is God, all right? So we don't see that, right? We're unable to see that, but according to this, that's a function of some kind of problem within our will, Ratzon, okay? All right, but in, its tr in truth, everything is one, okay? That's his starting point. So let's think a little bit now about Shuvah, all right? If you go to the next page, the second page, all right, let's think about the implications of this. If everything's really good, yeah, then the first implication of this will be, um, and you know, for the sake of time, I've, I've bracketed bits that we'll read um, in case there isn't time, so we'll go with the bracketed bits. So you've got here, this is from um, the, the, by the, on the right hand side, by the, those are the Prakim 
um, in Oral Tatruva that the quotes are taken from. Okay? And he said, Hahavaya he bichlaluta beloshum chet. Yeah? The kind of reality, you know, as a whole overall, is it, devoid of sin. There's no sin, which is kind of obvious. Yeah? If reality's God, there can't be any sin in it. Yeah? Hachet hu matso rak be erech hapratim. Right? Sin is only found kind of through the estimation of individuals, of particulars. Right? Sin, sin is kind of a function of separation. Yeah? Because we don't see how everything's related to God, we don't see how everything's perfect. We therefore see sin. But as I say, sin's not real. Okay? Um, as he goes on, it's a klal hakol matim laharmonia nitzchit. Okay? It kind of in the, in, from the vision of the whole, everything is a kind of, you know, a perfect eternal harmony. All right? Everything's God, so there's no sin. All right? Well, well obviously there is, because, you know, it's what we're all thinking about now, and we've got to do tshuva for it. So what does that mean, there's no sin? Okay, what, what can that possibly mean? So this is where his view of tshuva becomes very interesting. And, you know, in a sense, both the, one of the th interesting things about Ralph Cook is he is this kind of strange hybrid of modernism and mysticism. Okay? Have a look at the second quote now. This is from Perek Vav. And he says, Ahavaya, again, reality. Hamaser habchiri shel ha'adam ratzonoha kavua. All right? Um, the... Uh, basically made up of the actions, the free actions chosen by our fixed will, our kind of character. Hinam shal shelet achat kudola. Yeah, all just one single chain. Yeah, sheme olam enam netakim echad mechaviro. That one cannot be separated from the other. Okay, that every act we do, everything, every act is, forms some kind of single chain. All right, well, well, we can kind of understand that. I do one thing, causes me to do another thing, causes me to do another thing. But he means much more than that. Because if you go to the kind of, you know, the third line there, Kevan. Kevan she'en davar mitna tekla Since nothing is actually, you know, totally separated from anything else. Yesh bayad hachefetz lahat viat sivyon miyuchad gam al hamasim shavru. That means it's in the kind of, in the hands of desire of our, of our ratzon, yeah, of our will to actually kind of stamp some kind of special character or configuration even on the past. Okay, everything's linked. And if everything's linked, then what I do now affects what I did in the same way as what I did affects what I do. Right? Everything's linked. Everything is kind of, you know, interconnected. And he goes on, V'zehu sod ha-tshuva, and that is the secret of tshuva. Shebara ata ha-kadosh baruch hu, koden shebara et holam. Yeah, God created it before he created the world. Kloma, hirchiv et koach ha-yitzira ha-nefashit ha-ruchanit. He broadened the strength of our creative kind of um, spiritual uh, souls. B'yichusa el ha-maasim v'havaya, ad she-atihia tofeset b'yoshuta gam et ha-avar. He created it so you have this kind of yuchus, this relationship, yeah, between our deeds and reality, such that we can even, in the acts that we do, grasp onto the past. Okay, what does that mean? Well, it's actually a very simple idea. Um, it's something you find also in Rav Soloveitchik. Yeah, um, let's take World War One. World War I was not World War I until there was World War II. Yeah? And it became one World War I after World War II. Right? The way things develop and continue change the way we interpret the past. Okay? And that's what he's saying. Right? I sin. All right? I do a sin. Through tshuva, I can change that sin such that rather than being a bad thing, it becomes the springboard to my being a better person now. So it's actually good, the old Reish Lakish thing about Zdonot Zchuyot. Yeah? Right, so, I can, this kind of idea of 
to kind of stamp some kind of new character on it. That's what we're meant to do with tshuva. Okay? We're meant to reconfigure, re-describe what it is we did such that it's no longer a sin because it's actually the thing that led me to the good thing I do now. All right? So that's kind of number one. But much more than that, he goes on, okay? through this tshuva, everything returns to God, everything returns to the kind of starting reality. Right? Yeah, all this is through the reality of the strength of tshuva, hashareb olamin kulam, which is inscribed in all words, shav hakolomit kasheb imsiot hashleimot ha'elohit. Okay, everything is then kind of tied together, knotted together in this perfect reality. Now let's pause and try and understand what's going on and how this relates to cosmic tshuva and how this relates to the idea of tshuva being created before the world. Okay? We all exist in time. Okay? When I perform a sin, I do that, and I've got to wait until I recognize it, and I do all the hard work, and I change it. So, for a prolonged period, there's that sin. It's hanging there, and it needs to be redressed. And that's because we're in time. God isn't. As far as God's concerned, if everything's just mapped out, laid out in one go before him, as soon as you do the sin, the truth is already there. He doesn't have to wait for it. If you have a, the whole of reality laid out before you in one fell swoop, then it's true there is no such thing as hate. Hate is a result of our temporal perception. I've sinned, so I've got to do something about it. Mitzi Deinu, yeah, but from God's perspective, no, it's all laid out in one, because all reality is divine. And therefore, there might be a sin, but immediately the truth is already there in God's perspective. And that's kind of got to be the case. Because if you go back to Orot Kodesh, where he said, look, creation is kind of to do with with disunity, okay? Creation is about disunity. Well, God can't be disunified. God is a unity, okay? God can't be a disunity, correct? Which means that, in effect, tshuva had to be created before creation. Creation implies God's not a unity. And that's not true. God is a unity. Again, it's our percept. We perceive the world as separate, so we perceive God as not being a unity. But he is, which means teshuvah has to be there in the first... If teshuvah is the thing that returns God to unity, it had to be there from the start. Otherwise, God's hanging around being disunified. That's not possible. God has to be a unity all the time. Again, it's only our perception that he's not. It's our perception of all these separated things that means, number one, there is sin, because from our perspective, there is. And number two, right now, there's this thing creation. It's separate from God, so God is not a unity. In reality, though, God is a unity, and there's no sin, because God is perfect. It's just we can't see it. So, through tshuva, what we're really doing for Rav Cook is seeing the world correctly, so to speak. All right? Perfection is there right now. It's not that we've got to wait. And make, it's there right now. If only we could see it. If only we could see through all the disunity and all the fragmentation and understand that actually everything is connected and everything relates to God. And God is in that state always. Creation is kind of, so to speak, our creation, okay? It's our inability to see that. It's the yurida of the ratson, and it's the ratson that can reconfigure, that can, you know, stamp this different view of reality according to which we recognize, you know, there isn't really sin. And Shuvah's kind of there already. It has to be. 
if God is to genuinely be a unity. So that's number one. Okay, number one is that according to Rav Cook, you know, we think about, you know, individuals, we sin, we do whatever we do. We don't really think of its cosmic significance. We don't think of it in terms of, actually, this is in the most literal sense, tikkun olam. Okay, this is genuinely about seeing the world correctly, about repair, you know, repairing the world. Because if we understood it all correctly, there would be no disagreement, there would be no fighting, there would be, it would be this harmonia nitzchit. Everything would be harmony. That, for Rav Cook, is what genuine tshuva is about. And therefore, you know, it's taken us 20 minutes to uh, rewind 500 years and reverse the Copernican revolution, because the world really does revolve around us. Okay? It's all about us. Okay? If we do that, the world will be repaired. Okay? We will see it aright. So that's number one. Obviously, you know, quite how you do that requires a lot of hard work, study, mitzvot, morality, such things. And, you know, that might bring us to see this kind of almost, you can see it's a strange mystical vision. All right? To actually see everything as genuinely unified is... Uh, going to be some kind of mystical type vision and Rav Cook, you know, tells us that explicitly. All right, that end point is kind of, you know, somewhat mystical. So Rav Cook, number one, is trying to show, you know, what does it mean to say Chiva brings Geula redemption? Yeah, well it, you know, if you like, fixes God. All right, it brings us to a correct understanding of the world and God. And number two, what does it mean that Chuva was created before creation? Yeah, like we say, in reality, from a God's eye view, any sin has already been repented for. The repentance is there in place immediately for him. It's just for us. We have to go through time to get there. Number one. Number two is a bit simpler. Hey, number two. I think the second thing that Rav Cook is concerned about, and this is something that I, you know, I believe um, is motivated by his uh, awareness of certain modern philosophers. Okay, philosophers that you know he mentions, Spinoza. Okay, in the spirit of Rav Cook, even heretics are actually have kind of spark of holiness. So Spinoza and Nietzsche. Because both Spinoza and Nietzsche criticized repentance. They both thought that repentance was a practice that weakens human beings by thinking of ourselves as sinners, for castigating ourselves, by thinking that we're kind of, you know, terrible people. That's psychologically damaging. It weakens you, it's a bad thing. Okay, a couple of quotes there that you have. Spinoza, pretty pithy. Repentance is not a virtue. Yeah, it does not arise from reason. He who repents of his action is doubly unhappy and weak. Okay? Nietzsche, as ever, a little more flowery, um, says, one need only ask psychiatrists what happens to patients who are methodically subjected to the torments of repentance, states of contrition, and fits of redemption. In the wake of repentance and redemption training, we find tremendous epileptic epidemics. As another after effect, we encountered terrible paralyses and protracted states of depression. Okay? Tshuva, if you really drive this notion of sin to its depths, I'm terrible, I'm a sinner, I'm going to be punished, what do I do? I can't change it. Yeah, it's there, engraved forever in history. That can drive you crazy. And it can weaken you and it can be psychologically damaging. And you know what? In the Middle Ages, a lot of uh, writing about tshuva kind of did live up to or down to that description. Okay, just one quote here from Rabbeinu Yonah. You have to trust me that this is reflective. Um, he says there, Umadre got ha-tshuva maloteha lefi godel hamrirut v'otsem ha-yagon. Okay, speaks of, you know, levels of tshuva proportional to the depths of depression and despair that you can reach. The more depressed and despairing you are, the better. All right? That's, you know, that's exactly what Nietzsche's talking about. All right? That would kind of, you know, absolutely fits with his description. 
So it's there, yeah, in our tradition as much as any other. And along comes Ralph Cook. Okay? And what does Ralph Cook say? He says something very interesting. Okay? This is from Tet, okay, from uh, Peric Tet of Orot HaTshuva. And he talks, starts at the thing with HaTshuva, but let's go down for the sake of time. He muhrachet lihiot sofeget ima ezo chulsha. Shelo nimlat mimena afilo hagibor sheva giborim. Okay, Tshuva has to, has to basically suffer weakness. Okay, it has to absorb weakness. It weakens you. And even the strongest can't overcome that. Okay, tshuva, it does weaken you for exactly the reasons that Spinoza and Nietzsche say. Okay, if we, if we carry on, when you contract or shrink the will, yeah, when we somehow kind of, you know, bend the forces of life by with some kind of inner withdrawal, we withdraw, we're like introspecting and aren't we terrible? And we have this inclination to return from all sin. At the same time, that cannot but shrink your will, for the will is the will. Okay? If you're shrinking your will because you're bad and you're regretting and you're worried and you're remorseful, that shrinks your will to do good as well. Alright? Rav Cook admits, he says, you know what? They're right. They're absolutely right. That kind of remorseful, regretful tshuva is it weakens you. All right. Um, yeah, actually. So, so I mean, let, let's we might as well. Um, we'll just continue there. Nimsadam sovel musarit shakazot. Okay, a person suffers from his kind of from the purity of, of his morality. Yeah, this kind of weakness. Okay, precisely because I'm being moral, I have to be good. I have to that. that a weakness, he says, Okay, he suffers just, it's like a sick person, yeah, who's had electric shock therapy, all right? Makes you better, but boy, does it, you know, cause you damage, all right? He admits that, and therefore, it's interesting that at the end of this, he says, therefore, that's exactly why, after this, we have Sukkot Simchat Torah, because you have to replenish the resources, the positive resources, so that you won't be left in that weak state. Okay, so tshuva does weaken you. It is damaging in that way. And therefore, it's very interesting, if you look finally from Yudalaf, where he talks about various different forms of tshuva. And on the second line there, again he says, Omnam tshuva b'chol ofen v'tsurashi hi, every form of tshuva tsovelet b'tchilata mechalishut haratzon shel acharata hakodemet. Okay, at the beginning, it always suffers from the weakening of regret. Regret and remorse, are, they weaken you. Okay, they weaken you. And therefore it's interesting that he begins with mitzad habina, yeah, so there's tshuva that comes from, from Bina, but then he goes down, you'll see kind of just on the fourth line, Yoter um, Mizeh Baha Or Shela Chochma. Okay, so greater than this tshuva of Bina is tshuva of Chochma, which is what Shimei Olam, Lo Hutzrach Lechalesh Al Yadei Machova Charata. That doesn't actually deal with regret in this way. Doesn't suffer from the weakening of regret. Yeah? Uh, okay, it already finds the zchuyot there. It's kind of like we said at the beginning, yeah? Is hate real? No, everything's God. We don't see that, so we're immersed in kind of regret and remorse and weakness and psychological damage, unless we have this kind of, as I say, quasi-mystical ability to see almost immediately the good in it and not to suffer from this weakness. And actually, he goes even further than that. Um, and if you look, Lamala Mize, okay, again, underlined about halfway through. He hofat or haketa klali. Okay, so, you know, the light of the kete haklali, all right, the kind of, you know, the crown, this kind of, you know, deeply um, Kabbalistic here. Um, getting into uh, uh, Svirot, etc. But what is here? Haskira ha'aluma ha'makro kol oneg ve'eden which is this kind of, you know, this, this hidden vision 
yeah, of which you know is basically a vision of everything that is on Egve Eder. It's kind of you know it's 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 um, it's joy, kol kadosh vatov. It's all holy and goodness. Yeah, hakolet lekol ba'ot sakdusha. Or rather, eina mishta meshet klal ba'achanat ha'charata shel hatchalat ha'arat habina. The highest form of repentance does not deal at all with regret, the regret that you have with bina and chokma. Okay, that's pretty radical. All right, from Ma'alot HaTshuva, it's all about kind of, you know, Mrirut, Yagon, to saying actually the highest form of Tshuva doesn't contain regret or remorse at all. Okay? Because ultimately, again, the thing that I think Rav Cook believed had not been recognized properly was something that maybe only came to light as a result of modern critique, which is how damaging repentance can actually be how damaging certain repentant practices can actually be. So what does he do? He actually says, yes, you're right, it is. Nietzsche and Spinoza were right. But actually, his form of repentance, the Jewish form of repentance, isn't about that. The highest forms don't actually engage in that. Right now, it's, you know, this isn't license for you to not regret or worry about anything you've done, okay? He's talking here about the highest level. To, to be at that level genuinely, not self-deceptively. It'd be very easy for us to say, yeah, no, I don't regret. Okay? That's just being self-deceptive. To genuinely understand, to genuinely see things that way is difficult. So this isn't license for everyone to say, don't have to do tshuva. Yeah? You have to do the highest form of it. And that's tough, and only a few people can do it. Vouchsafe to the few. But it's quite incredible to think of a form of tshuva that, you know, pretty much negates a whole history of writing on tshuva, that it is all about kind of, you know, self-castigation and driving your kind of psychological torment to depths of despair. Not about that for Rav Cook. So that's number two, okay? What Rav Cook believed was that our kind of literary tradition on the subject of tshuva had neglected its cosmic aspects, had neglected this idea of what is it that we're actually meant to do. Well, we're meant to reconfigure, rethink, reinterpret such that we see everything together and we see almost the tshuva simultaneously with the chait, because there is no chait, everything's God. And we've got to return to that, number one. And number two, he understood that the modern critique of tshuva has something to it. The idea of kind of, you know, somehow driving yourself to the depths of despair weakens your will and it's problematic and remember it's the will that is the very thing that can save you that can do tshuva it's the rutson in the kind of opening half of tonight that we use in order to reconfigure so you weaken that it's even more difficult to do tshuva so the second thing that Rav Cook understood was that actually, you know, a lot of the writings on Shuva, in his view, obviously, you know, he might be wrong, they might be right, but in his view, they were barking up the wrong tree. Okay? Um, and just, it's, it's worth noting, um, some of you know, most of you don't, I happen to be obsessed with Nietzsche. Um, so it's not just me, all right? <laughs> Benjamin is Shalom, if you look at the final quote here, actually says the same. He says, rather than rejecting Nietzsche's claims, Rav Cook accepted some of his seemingly basic assumptions. Nietzsche's basic interest, the aggrandizement of selfhood, becomes Rav Cook's own, yet he pro proposed a truly alternative view. Um, so there you go. Alternative tshuva, something to think about in the upcoming days. <laughs>